nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. We're very happy today to have Dimitri Perulis with us. Professor Perulis, uh, some of you may know, is a professor in the School of Electrical Engineering here. Uh, and also has a courtesy appointment here in the School of Mechanical Engineering as well. Uh, as much as a Michigan State graduate I am, it's, it's hard for me to say. Mm -hmm. Professor Perulis did go to the other school in Michigan, probably the better school, <laughs> University of Michigan. Uh, and got his PhD there in 2003, uh, and has been here at Purdue since the uh, fall of 2003 as well. Uh, his primary research areas are things uh, involving uh, MEMS, which you'll hear about today, in particular do developing uh, various signal processing systems, uh, some sensing systems uh, for a variety of applications. Uh, in particular today, he's going to tell us a little about his work in developing MEMS for harsh environments, and in particular wireless sensors for harsh environments. I think it's important to know, and I think you'll see this today in his lecture, that uh, Professor Perlis, despite his many research accomplishments, uh, is also a very decorated teacher here on campus, and I think fits in that uh, very rare class of faculty member that uh, has demonstrated absolute excellence in both uh, research and in, uh, in, in teaching and education. So with that, uh, please let's give a warm applause for Professor Perlis. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I was told I have to put two mics on, <laughs> but I will also try to, to speak loudly. Uh, so uh, as Professor Rhodes said, I am in the other school here at Purdue, uh, School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, we do work on the MEM side, and it's always a little bit embarrassing for me to talk about micro, micro electromechanical systems to mechanical engineers, uh, since I really never got a degree in mechanical engineering. But that's why I collaborated with the excellent faculty you have here. I'm still trying to learn how to do those things. Um, so, um, how many of you have ever played with a Wii? Awesome. So the Wii is one of the wonderful devices, probably the very first one, that put the MEMS into a significant uh, consumer market. Uh, the Wii had the MEMS inertia sensor that it was basically, you can see right here, it was a basic, basically an accelerometer that had the capability of identifying motion. So then came the cell phones. So the cell phones started being able to identify motion that all of us make through sensors as well. Cell phones today have close to uh, 10 degree of freedom uh, measurement devices, including accelerometers and gyros and all of them are micro-machined. Uh, most phones today have roughly one device per smartphone, uh, and we're producing about 420 million smartphones, um, and the future is about three to five MEMS devices per cell phone, and in a production level that will exceed a billion. So if we're talking about a billion smartphones, out of which every single one of them will have about five devices, you can imagine that this is by far the largest MEMS market in the world. So even though the MEMS area has been around for a long time now, I would say at least 30, 40 years, it's only recently that started becoming really big business. And I think you will see that it's not just for the commercial world, but also for niche area applications that this talk is going to mostly focus on. So what do you find in a typical RFID sensor? Um, here's a person who is checking out some books from the library, and each one of these books has a little bit of an ID chip that can wirelessly tell you when that chip is going in and out of the library. This is going to be in an antenna like so, and there's going to be a little ID chip right in the middle. It's not quite a sensor. It can't really sense, for example, the temperature of the book, or how much strain you're applying on the book, or what's the weight of the book. But it can tell you that this book is moving. And so that's kind of the first step. And that little chip you can actually see down there. There is wireless communication with some type of interrogators. These are basically the reading coils, and those reading coils are now, now hidden inside those little columns. And life is good as long as we're talking about the commercial world. But there are unique challenges when we talk about the Department of Defense sensing. One unique challenge, for example, is that the ideal structure you may want to put might not be possible due to weight and um, due to size constraints. Another thing is that most of the environments in every day don't go as hot as 200 degrees C. 
despite opposite rumors in July in Lafayette. <laughs> However, in many DOD applications, you could actually find temperatures as high as 200 degrees C, 500 degrees C, 1000 degrees C, and even higher. No batteries. If you imagine basically a world of electronics living at, let's say, 300 degrees Celsius, there is no battery you can use for that. So we have to forget about the conventional way of, of powering an electronic uh, sensor. Material properties. Most of the sensors are manufactured assuming that they are going to work in a room temperature environment, give or take. Well, material properties do change a lot as you're moving in higher, temp higher temperatures, so that has to be taken into account as well. Also, in an everyday RFID type of system, you don't expect your signal to have to go through a lot of metallic obstacles. Um, usually, it's free space or maybe a few chairs, maybe a few human bodies, but that's about it. That's relatively easy. It's a lot harder to make a signal communicate, for example, through the housing of a bearing. So there are really unique challenges that need to be addressed. And the application we're going to talk about here is about bearing failures. So you guys, I'm sure, know bearings much better than I do. Uh, the way I understand bearings is that they are basically more or less like what the uh, joints in our bodies are. These are the bearings for machines. And they do occasionally fail due to lots of different reasons. Uh, this is, for example, a, a, a spall in a bearing that might have been caused by high temperature or high load or improper balancing and so on and so forth. So how do we prevent bearing failure in important applications? Well, we do what's called the time-based maintenance. Every so often, we go and we change the bearing. Uh, do we know if the bearing is still uh, capable of working? No. Um, but somebody said every 50, 100, 2,000, a million hours, I don't know, whatever the case might be, go ahead and change your bearing. Now, this practice is fairly old. I don't know if you can recognize that picture here, but this bearing, it looks surprisingly similar to our modern bearings, is actually was discovered in ancient Rome. So the idea of doing basically time-based maintenance goes really back a few thousand years. And we haven't really progressed that much today. And that's not true just for bearings. Bearing is just one example. So why is that? Why do we always go for a time-based maintenance? Because we don't know anything better. We cannot reliably sense today when a bearing will fail. And so that's the big motivation for developing sensors, finding out ways that you can identify why and how a bearing will fail. So the problem, in addition to, doing, in addition to having the safety issue that I just mentioned, that we don't know when something will fail, there is a cost issue associated with that as well. When you change a bearing so, many, so often, you may be throwing away a lot of resources, and you may be throwing away a lot of materials too. For example, today, if you look at how many hours of maintenance we spend on aircraft per hour of flight time, you can clearly see that we spend a lot of time. Um, I'm not going to give you the exact hours, but we're talking about tens of hours of maintenance required uh, for every hour an aircraft flies today. And part of this maintenance is because we have to change everything so often. Of course, there is a lot of, env a lot of environmental concerns. Uh, you have to basically throw away tons of things that may be oil, may be mechanical components that could be perfectly fine. So the, the idea is, the solution is to go to what's called the condition-based maintenance. Instead of doing, instead of saying every so often I'm going to change the bearing, assess the condition of the bearing and make the change when it has to be made. Now, this is easier said than done. In order to practically identify when something has to be changed, you have to have some type of a measurement. And everything that you will see here has been done in collaboration with Professor Sadegi from uh, this department, uh, who is a true expert in bearings. We're just trying to make the sensors for them. And if you ask Professor Sadegi, he will say that the way to basically measure a bearing is to look at its temperature and or strain. It's more or less like a human being, right? When we are all sick, our temperature goes up. So if you can sense the temperature, you know something about the true condition. So if we could do that, if we could reliably sense the temperature of a bearing, we could have our first way of providing a good solution for, for that problem. 
Now, there are some requirements that such a bearing sensor would have to fulfill. Um, I have already mentioned a few of them. For example, we might have to worry about high temperatures. Some of the bearings are working in conditions that could exceed 300 degrees Celsius. And so what you will see here are sensors specifically made for high temperature operation. Also, a bearing is something that moves all the time. So if you're going to stick a sensor on the bearing, it better have the capability of wirelessly transmitting its signal. Uh, otherwise, it's obviously not practical. Also, we have to forget about optical communications because you often don't have line of sight for bearings. The sensitivity has to be decent. We're talking about the ability to identify roughly a degree of Celsius change. The sensor has to be extremely well protected. Most of the bearings work in pretty dirty environments where there is a lot of oil, uh, potential contaminants, and other things, corrosive, for example, material that might damage the sensor. The size of the sensor has to be pretty small. You cannot just have a commercial sensor. You cannot buy just a commercial accelerometer and just stick it on the bearing. It will immediately unbalance it. It has to be low cost. We have to make sure that it's only temperature that we're reading and not other inertia forces. And we have to make it out of a robust material such that the lifetime of the sensor exceeds the expected lifetime of the bearing. It's a pretty long list of requirements, and if you if you look at those, you realize why we don't have those sensors today. If you look at everything that you can buy off the market, and you make tables like this, you can find out, for example, that people have investigated a number of different devices. For example, thermocouples, or fiber optics, or active silicon devices. But then if you see how many of those requirements they satisfy, there is not a single technology that basically meets all of them. And that's why we thought it was a really interesting challenge to try to make a technology that will meet all of these requirements. And so here's the idea. We place the bearing sensor on the cage, and the heart of the sensor is this little capacitor right here. This little capacitor is what will, what will actually respond to temperature, and this capacitor is placed with an interrogating coil right here. Uh, you can imagine this as an antenna, if you will, as a near-field antenna. And this whole thing is attached on the bearing cage. And so you can see a typical bearing cage right there. Now, what happens is that as the temperature is changing, your temperature sensitive capacitance is changing. And therefore, the resonant frequency of this LC circuit will change. How do we read the change? By essentially another interrogating coil that you can see right here. You can imagine this as the reader for your sensor. And this reader, if you look at its impedance, which is similar to looking at the capacitance, you will basically find out that that changes as a function of temperature. So that's basically the fundamental idea. Make a sensor that is sensitive enough, put it on the bearing cage, attach an antenna to it, and use another antenna to read it. How do the sensors look like? Well, um, they're made of two different layers, two different materials. Uh, there is a metal on the top, and there's a dielectric on the bottom. And the reason for that is because those two materials have a different thermal expansion coefficient, roughly a, a matter of a 10x difference. They're anchored at one point, so you have a cantilever beam right here. And so at room temperature, those sensors tend to basically um, bend upwards. Um, the dimensions of these guys are close to about 300 microns in length, so that's 30 micrometers wide and about a micrometer thickness. So we're talking about an extremely uh, small device uh, for, most, um, for most applications. Now, what happens is that as you raise the temperature, the metallic material on the top tends to expand more than the dielectric material on the bottom, and therefore you basically see the profile of this beam changing. In fact, you can design such a system such that you obtain a perfectly flat beam at the maximum temperature that you want this device to operate at. And then what's happening is that the capacitance of between the beam and the substrate is being recorded. And so there is a one-to-one -one correlation between capacitance and temperature. Now, here are a couple of uh, examples of measurements done on some of the devices that you will see in a minute. Uh, and the measurements are shown with those red circles while the um, modeling that has been done in this area is shown with the blue line. And each one of these little uh, measurements has been taken from several different beams. Uh, so you will see one of the things that we have been able to do over the number of years we're working in this area 
is to make fairly high yield devices and fairly high performing devices. So the fact that we do match with the analytical model is pretty encouraging. Now, as I mentioned before, by choosing the right materials, you can design the sensors to respond to different temperature ranges. For example, this sensor here with this black line can only respond to up to about 100 degrees C. But this sensor here can basically respond up to about 600, maybe 650 or 700 degrees C. So it's a matter of design, essentially, where do you want to park the sensitivity of the sensor? So this image is, a, is an optical image that has been taken from an actual sensor that was made. Um, you can see a, a number of those cantilever beams here. In fact, we're talking about something in the order of 500 beams that are being pictured here. And each one of those beams is identical to the next. Um, there are many reasons why we need more than just a single beam per sensor. Uh, one of them, for example, is redundancy. We don't want to rely on just a single beam. Another one is that the single beam does not provide enough of a capacitance, if you will. So if we want to hit a, a specific capacitance value, we need to make sure that a lot of them are connected in parallel. And another reason is that we don't want these beams to be subject to inertia forces. That's why we don't make like a huge plate, because a huge plate would respond not just to temperature, but also inertia. These beams are so light, we're talking about weights less than 10 to the negative 10 kilograms, that practically speaking, they would not respond to any acceleration as long as we're not talking about, you know, a thousand Gs or 10,000 Gs. Now, once these MEMS chips are made with those silicon, with those beams on the silicon substrate, then we take that silicon substrate and we package it. Remember that we said about the need for hermetic packaging, the need for a really good package that will protect the sensor from the environment around it. So the packaging happens by taking the silicon substrate and essentially putting it on a TO header. And the, sub, the sensor is being, is being released subsequently, so the beams are deflecting upwards. And right on top of that TO, TO's header, we basically have a little metallic can that comes and is getting welded. So that welding is what's providing basically the hermetic seal that protects the sensor from, from its environment. Here you can see an image of that sensor. Uh, you can see the MEMS beams. In this case, we opened, uh, we basically used the package with a glass window so we could see the sensor inside. And here you can see the size of the sensor uh, basically on somebody's palm. This size is by far not the smallest one that can be made. In fact, this, this package is huge compared to the little sensor, but it's small enough for our case. We could easily miniaturize this guy by more than 10x if we, if we had to. So the important thing when you make those sensors is not just to make a structurally sound device, but its electrical properties have to also be good. What do we mean by, what do we mean by electrical properties? It means that we're truly making a capacitor, a device that can store energy, rather than a resistor, which is a device that can dissipate energy. If we had made the resistor here, in other words, if the losses of these guys were too high, electrical losses, I mean, then you wouldn't be able to interrogate anything, anything from there. The measure for this is called quality factor, or Q, which is listed in the first column of that table. So we have basically gone over the years from quality factors that are in the order of about 700, decent but not great, all the way down to basically about 5,000, which is much better and makes something work in real life. Just to give you an idea of what that means, I have actually plotted an interesting graph here where on the vertical axis you can see this quality factor, which is again, is a measure of quality of your sensor as a function of the maximum operating temperature of the sensor. So if you can see the vast majority of industrial electronics are basically in the order of 100 to 150 degrees C. They get pretty decent quality factors. Most of them are in the order of 1,000, but their maximum temperature is close to 100, 120 C. There are a few outliers, like the TRS technologies, where the temperature can actually exceed 300 degrees C, but that comes at a penalty of a pretty low quality factor. This work that I'm describing to you right now is right here. Essentially, you can see it's basically pushing the envelope, it's pushing the frontier of not just increasing the quality factor, but also the maximum operating temperature. And there is also a pretty graceful degradation of this quality factor that we're reading at room temperature as a function of temperature. 
For example, you can see that all the way to about 170 degrees or 180 degrees, the quality factor still remains above about 500, while it is in the neighborhood of 5 to 6,000 at room temperature. Please. <laughs> so the quality factor has to do with the, uh, with the parasitics of the sensor. So this is basically measured with a typical LCR meter. Essentially, you're feeding the sensor with some energy and you're counting how quickly the sensor dissipates that energy. That's basically the, uh, the quality factor definition. So the faster it dissipates? The lower the quality factor would be, exactly. So you want to, to hold the energy? That's right. A true capacitor will hold the energy. Uh, a true resistor will dissipate it immediately. Somewhere in between is where all the devices exist. But the reason for that, and I'll show you in a minute, is that if the quality factor was not good enough, you're basically, that curve I showed you before where, where we're looking at the impedance as a function of frequency, it wouldn't be sharp enough, it would basically be a blur. So you wouldn't be able to detect exactly at what temperature your sensor is residing. Now the other thing uh, that you can ask about this um, is basically speed, right? The speed of these devices is actually extremely high uh, compared to most thermocouples out there. And for the interest of time, I'm not going to go through every single frame. Uh, it's also not extremely, um, it's not very visible here. But essentially, we're looking at the optical images and we're counting frames of how quickly it takes for these guys to dissipate, to actually deflect, rather. So it takes roughly about 600 microseconds to go from room temperature to about 300 degrees C for these devices. So if you will, you can add another dimension in the, in the graph I showed you before, where it was quality factor versus temperature, add one more dimension, and that's basically the speed. This speed of 600 microseconds is much more, uh, it's actually much less than uh, most thermocouples out there that work at high temperatures. So even if you didn't really need any wireless capabilities, just because of the speed, you might decide to use something like this. Now, the question that always comes in this case is what is the reliability of these sensors? So I'm going to talk a little bit about two different families of tests that we have done. One family involves testing these sensors under a constant load. That's kind of the worst possible scenario, if you will. So you take these sensors, you put them at, let's say, 200, 250, 300 degrees temperature, and you just let the sensor stay there. And you try to see if there are any memory effects, both in the loaded condition as well as in the unloaded condition. So the way we did that is that we basically looked at the true profile of those beams. This is what this graph shows here. This graph is coming from a confocal microscope that we have in the lab from Olympus. And what you will be looking at is at the tip height of that sensor. So any change in the tip height would basically tell you that you are changing the physical uh, displacement of the sensor. Now, after you immediately fabricate those sensors, they don't behave very well there is an additional step that is needed, and that step is called annealing. So here, for example, in this graph, with the black dots, you can basically see the displacement uh, of the tip of the sensor after it has been fabricated, and after you start annealing this guy at uh, about 200 degrees C. So after the annealing, the displacement has changed from, let's say, about 130 microns to only about 60 microns. But after that, it's stable. The same thing is true for the lower, for the high temperature. So right after the sensor is fabricated, you will see that there is a significant displacement as a function of time when you hold it at some temperature. But that will go away after essentially the sensor has been burned in, if you will. So the fabrication doesn't basically stop right when you finish the fab. It basically stops after about 30 hours of annealing. That's when the sensors are hardened and they're basically ready to go on and work for you. So, yes? That means that the, the capacitance also change, right? Correct. During, during the annealing process, the question was, does the capacitance change? Yes, it does change. But after the annealing process is done, the capacitance change remains basically constant. So let's look at some of the results. So here's one result uh, that we're looking at basically the entire beam profile. In this case, we're not just looking at the tip of the beam, but the entire beam profile, essentially at two different points in time, right after the annealing process has been completed, uh, and then three months later of constant loading in the oven at about 250 degrees C. And what you will basically see is that the profile has hardly changed uh, 
between those two points in time. Now, after this loading is removed, after essentially you remove it away from the oven, what you would really like to see is the sensor to go back to its original temperature, to its original displacement. And that's exactly what you will see here. After we basically took those samples out of the oven and we compared to the profile of those beams after they had been just been fabricated and annealed, and three months later, essentially the two curves fell on top of each other. So that basically shows you that there is no uh, memory effect on those sensors and you could really trust the performance of these guys. We also did a lot of uh, statistics, if you will. We didn't do this for just a single beam. In fact, we have done, we have fabricated literally hundreds of these sensors over a period of about seven years now. And we have collected statistical data for dozens of them. What is interesting to realize, and here I'm showing some statistical data, here we're looking at the beam high deviation. So basically out of all the samples that we, we observed, what is basically the profile? And you can see that if we center all of the sensors around zero, there is basically a Gaussian profile for nearly all of them. But most importantly, that Gaussian profile is maintained as a function of the number of hours that you keep loading those sensors. So if the sensors were not reliable enough, what you would see is that you would start with one distribution now, and then three months later, you would have ended up with a completely different distribution because every sensor would have basically bent it in a different way. And that's not what's happening. And this is in the up state. In the down state, the distribution is even tighter, and you will see that as a function of the number of hours, the statistical data for the sensors don't change. Each beam is basically locked to where it started from, and uh, the, the, the performance is basically almost unchanged. That's another way that you can basically judge the quality of the, of the sensors. The down state represents zero degrees. The down state, uh, the question is if it represents zero degree, the down state actually represents the maximum temperature. Uh, in this particular case, is about 275 degrees Celsius. Um, these are some of the images that uh, we have been talking about. Um, one of the questions, though, that we had to answer here is, okay, after we are done with a constant loading, how do we cycle these devices? Everybody wants to see how well they will perform after being cycled. We wanted to reach basically where no one else had gone. We wanted to exceed a billion cycles for these devices. The vast majority of high temperature sensors in the literature today are not measured for more than a few thousand cycles and that's it. So the problem is how do you basically measure something for a billion cycles? Obviously we're gonna take it inside the oven and, and out a billion times. It's not gonna be very efficient. So we made some samples where we applied joule heating. So in the joule heating, we take those metallic beams, rather than bimorph beams, and we basically pass current through the metal. And because we, the sensors respond so quickly, remember about 600 microseconds, you can basically uh, end up doing this test in, in a matter of just a few months. So we did that and we collected data uh, from several different samples. In this case, you can see we have data from about four separate samples, and we had about five beams on each sample. The, what is being recorded here is the tip height as a function of the number of cycles, and uh, we're recording this for both the minimum and the maximum temperature. Minimum temperature are the black lines, and uh, maximum temperature is the, is the red one. And what you will actually see is that for most practical purposes, the beam displacement doesn't appreciably change um, for each one of those samples. And if you were to take this uncertainty of the beam height profile, and you, go to, you were to translate it in terms of temperature uncertainty, you would find that we're looking at about three degrees or so of uncertainty. Not great, not the ultimate, but by far better than what has been done, much better than, than what you will actually see uh, with other devices. We have a few samples that uh, the students who were working in this work were basically kind enough and patient enough to push all the way to a billion cycles. The previous one, by the way, I did not mention that stops at about 100 million cycles. But a few of those samples were actually pushed all the way to 1.2 billion cycles. And um, again, we don't really see any failure or any dramatic changes, but we simply had to stop the test at some point. So I think the robustness of those beams is, is now clear as we are looking um, uh, essentially for over a billion cycles. <laughs>
Now, once you're certain about that, then you have to think about how exactly you place those sensors on the bearings. I'm not going to discuss this into too much detail here, uh, but as you can see, uh, this is the little sensor here on the right that is the inverted coke can that is basically mounted on the cage of the bearing. This is uh, the wires that are connecting the sensor to the interrogating coil are right next to it. And then there is a little receiver that comes on top of the bearing that carries the reading coil. So the reading coil is basically placed right on this guy, uh, which interrogates the sensor itself. Now let's look at some results and let's see what the sensors can actually do for you. So one of the things that they can, that they can do for you is that, as of course we want it, they can tell you the true temperature of the bearing. So in this graph you can see a temperature of an actual test, and this test again has been done in Professor Sedegi's lab here at Purdue in one of the testing rigs, as a function of time, and time is measured in minutes, and you will see two, di two types of curves. There is the red curve, which is basically the sensor uh, temperature, and then there is the thermocouple that is essentially attached to the housing of the bearing. So the black line, which is the thermocouple um, temperature reading, is basically what you can read today. For most applications, it's fairly easy to take a thermocouple and stick it at the outside of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the bearing. The problem with that is that, as you can see, it has absolutely no correlation to the temperature of the bearing, and it has no correlation to the changing conditions of the bearing. For example, the red line changes every time you basically change the speed of the bearing by 500 RPM. And of course, it changes with load as well. I don't have the graph with the load here, but it has a very similar behavior. Rather, the housing thermocouple gives you a type of an average type of response. In addition to being able to do this type of condition monitoring, you can essentially look at the condition of the bearing and identify how quickly it goes or how, uh, how much load there is on it. You can also use those sensors to identify imminent failures. So in this graph, you can see a measurement that was done on a bearing that did fail. And the vertical axis, there's a temperature again, time is on seconds on the horizontal axis. And again, I'm showing you the oil temperature. This is basically measured by that thermocouple. With the red line is the true temperature of the bearing. So right around here, right around at about 180 seconds, the failure is getting initiated. You can see that immediately the sensor picks up a huge and dramatic change of the temperature of the bearing. The temperature of the bearing essentially keeps rising all the way to about 150 C at about 600 seconds when the bearing finally stops working. On the other hand, the oil temperature remains practically constant for several hundreds of seconds. So if you did have an imminent failure that would occur, and you only had the existing sensor, most likely you wouldn't do anything before it was basically too late. For example, if that sensor was diagnosing a failure in an aircraft, you wouldn't be able to do anything for that. If, however, you knew the true temperature of the bearing, you would immediately be alerted, and you would have basically several hundreds of seconds to respond before basically a dramatic event happens. So that gives you the value of that sensor in terms of identifying imminent failures. We have also done long-term testing. I'm not gonna go in detail here, but we have run those guys for literally hundreds of hours, and uh, we don't really notice any failures in terms of the uh, detachment, for example, of the sensor from the bearing, or changes uh, that are unreasonable, and so on and so forth. This is one example where we're running the bearing at constant conditions, we shut it down and we restart it, and so on and so forth. Now, we have one version of those sensors that basically works up to 600 degrees Celsius. This was done afterwards, after we were able to understand how the material properties change and what the right materials are, uh, we were able to push the temperature of this sensor to about 600 degrees C. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail on that, but I do want to say that the key for making these sensors robust at high temperature is the right material selection and specifically the deposition method that you use for these guys here. If you just take a random metal and a random dielectric and you just put them together and you just put them on the substrate, nothing will work well. So there is a lot of engineering behind these guys that we're not covering today. That's why it has taken about seven years for this program to, to come to fruition. <laughs>
Um, this is just a little graph that shows you uh, exactly the same data I showed you before. The 300 degree sensor is sitting right here. The 600 degree sensor is actually right here on the right. So this is an area where we like to keep pushing the envelope and basically go even higher in temperature uh, if we can. Now, there is another type of problem that's very similar, and I would like to just show you about three slides on this. Those bearings I showed you before, they can work uh, in an environment that is basically obstructed with a lot of metal, but those sensors cannot penetrate metal, meaning the signal they emit, they cannot, they cannot go through metal. It's an RF signal, so clearly you will be stopped if you have a metal. There are situations, however, where you might want to sense a device when it's fully enclosed by a metallic enclosure. This is what I call here the, the see-through metal sensor. So a see-through metal sensor should be able to give you the condition of a bearing or another sensitive component when you have absolutely no access to it. This is something that has been done before, but the way we basically try to do it is by utilizing DC magnetic fields. See, if you take a magnet, as you can see up there, the DC magnetic field is a weak function of temperature. In fact, from basic physics, you may remember that as the temperature is increasing, some of the magnetic domains in the magnet get, misal get uh, misaligned. So what will happen is that as you keep increasing the temperature, the magnetic field will get weaker and weaker and weaker. And in fact, if you exceed the temperature, this is called the Curie temperature, the magnet will be completely demagnetized and will not be recovered. However, if you stay well below the Curie temperature, not only you see that effect where the DC magnetic field is a function of temperature, but the magnet fully recovers once you reverse the temperature increase and you go back to the original temperature. So there are different magnets for different temperature regimes. The neodymium-based magnets uh, practically will work up to about 150 C, and if you exceed the temperature, they will get fully demagnetized. They will not be able to recover that change. However, there are some medium cobalt magnets that will survive all the way to 350 degrees Celsius. There is the al nico magnet that will go all the way to 550 degrees Celsius. So depending on the application that you have, there is the right magnetic material to choose. For each one of them, there is a temperature coefficient that actually gives you how much in percentage you're changing the magnetic field for every degree of Celsius that you're reading. Now the wonderful thing here is that DC magnetic field will penetrate non-magnetic metal. Not all metal, if you have a fully magnetic metal, if you have like an iron, it will not penetrate it. But for many of the stainless steel example, for example, it will penetrate it. And so for many practical cases, you can use this, this idea to measure the temperature inside a fully uh, enclosed environment. This data give you a little bit of, a, um, if you will, the proof of concept of this device. So here is basically a magnet, uh, or rather a stack of magnet that is placed on a hot plate. And then at a distance of about a centimeter and a half, we have a Hall effect sensor. A Hall effect sensor is basically an electronic device that is tuned to magnetic uh, measurements. So you can look at the sensor output here as a function of temperature. And due to our imperfect measurement apparatus, in this particular measurement, there is a little bit of hysteresis, not much. The curve fit is still better than 98%. In later measurements that we have published, that hysteresis is not there. It's actually not coming from the magnet itself. It's coming from the different rate of heating and cooling that magnet, that it was not exactly right here. Interestingly enough, we did the test where we basically put a, a full metal in between the sensor and the, and the magnet. So down here, you can see the magnet, again on the hot plate. There is a stainless steel plate right here, and there is a Hall effect sensor right on top of it. So of course, in any type of RF wireless sensor, nothing you would have been collected, but for the DC magnet, um, you will get practically exactly the same data, where the sensor output, again, as a function of temperature, is practically linear. So this is one concept that we have already applied in a couple of different applications where, again, communicating through metal is necessary. So in conclusion, what I would like to basically mention is that there are now sensors enabled by MEMS devices that have the capability of correctly, accurately, and reliably assessing the condition of rotating machinery. Here I'm showing you bearings. There are other things that we have also identified with those sensors.
The key components for the success of this sensor is the MEMS technology that makes them small, inexpensive, reliable, and can be batched manufactured by any of the electronic processes. The wireless circuitry and the wireless design, and finally the robustness of the material. So thank you for paying attention to this, and I'll be very happy to answer questions. So a few questions for Professor Perlis. So you were mentioning earlier that you saw this like in the aero industry where you would use this sensing of the bearings that were going to fail to reduce the amount of preventive maintenance you'd have to do. If you're in an aircraft, what are you going to do in the 10 minutes between when the bearing starts heating up and when it fails? Land. <laughs> 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 I don't, I wouldn't do anything else. <laughs> All right. But just to give a little bit more of a, just to give you a little bit more of an answer there. One of the biggest trouble in industry is that not every aircraft goes through the same type of uh, torture, if you will. There's um, some, we usually count the amount of time those things fly, but that doesn't mean that they go through exactly the same conditions. So one bearing could fail after X amount of time, and the other bearing could fail after 10X amount of time. But because we have to be certain that things are good today, we have to replace everything at X. I mean, before X, but everything. We basically have to design for the worst case scenario. Even if the worst case scenario happens at 1% of the cases, you have to sacrifice the rest 99% for that 1%. That's the condition-based maintenance where they can basically save you from. Would, would it be worthwhile to like check like uh, low low temperature conditions? Because you know some airplanes you go like in winter, you know you got like negative forty. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's equally well worth it to check low temperature. Uh, except the the our sponsors so far have uh, made us focus on the high temperature conditions. Uh, the low temperature would be equally valuable. Also, I would say it's a little bit easier, uh, low temperature, until we reach cryogenics. Cryogenics is a little bit different story. But lower temperature, it's, it's not nearly as hard as the high temperature one. Please. Thank you this slide. All your sensors could be frequently varied. I'm sorry, you mean this slide? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So, I think that, you know, two materials, they have different summer expansion coefficients. So my question is, at high, high temperatures, the deformation will be significant, and probably that will, you know, prevent the bearing from working properly. So do you have such problems? And if, if you do have, how do you deal with them? Right. So in terms of the displacement of these devices, uh, the displacement is significant in the micro world, uh, meaning that these device, these beams, will literally deflect and move about 100 microns. Uh, you saw some measurements in the 60, 80, depends on the design. But remember that these devices are fully enclosed. The sensor is fully enclosed in a package. That displacement will not be seen by anybody else other than the capacitance reading circuitry. So it will not really impact any of the bearing changes. Back, back on my previous question, I was uh -huh. about, like, checking the material, making sure it's still, because you checked whether, you know, having the cycles, whether the material will, Mm -hmm. You know, still this, the same displacement for high temperature and low temperature. Yes. But some air, and this is for aircraft applications, so I'm saying some aircraft operate at negative, in at negative 40. Sure. So, I mean, if there's a cycling between 300 and negative 40, the sponsor may also, you know, want to check it at lower temperature. I agree with you. I, if, uh, if we had to propose extensions of projects like this, one of them would be to start characterizing at low temperatures. I absolutely agree with you. One last question for Professor Pruis in the So, um, you said that the cantilever is flat when you have the highest temperature. So, but it's easier to fabricate when you deposit the material so that it's flat. Yes, the material is actually deposited flat. So, when we fabricate the sensor, the deposition of the, of the material for the beam makes the beam being perfectly flat. What happens is that this is done over a sacrificial layer. So once the sacrificial layer is removed, that's when the stress is removed, is released rather, and the beam basically deflects upwards. But it is not fabricated in the upward uh, shape, for sure.
Okay, I think if there's any more questions, perhaps Professor Burles can take them offline. So let's thank him and uh... thank you so much. Thanks,